We are back with another episode of the SEC Football Hour here on Southeastern 16. It is episode number eight. I'm Chase Robinson. That's Chris Lee as we'll dive into all things SEC football. But first, let's tell you about Bet Online, the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything online sports betting. Right now, you can receive a 50% free bet of up to $250 on your first deposit to bet on anything from the Olympics to baseball to Formula One racing. Bet Online has every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads while the games are being played. When the game's over, you can head on over to the online casino, get in on a game of blackjack or poker, or over the 150 slots games. You can head over to the website today to get in on the action. Use promo code BELIEVE, B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% free bet credit on your first deposit up to $250. Bet Online, the game starts here. So, Chris, we are sitting here recording this on the 31st day of July. Uh, a lot of teams get ready to start fall camp, but if you, if you think about it, one month from today, August 31st, yeah. there's, there's going to be college football being played, SEC football being played one month from today. Yeah, we are firmly in recycle season, which means a lot of the same topics are going to be recycled over and over and over until something happens in fall camp and – we don't get to see a lot of fall camp most places. So it's when someone gets hurt, you know, speculation on a quarterback job, those type of things. But, hey, we will figure out ways to cover it. If people are new to the show, this is not a hot take show. We put in a lot of time. We do a lot of prep. Uh, we've seen the work each other puts in. We are not perfect, but we really try hard to bring you content that that sets at a level above what's out there. Uh, and, and I know the work we did today, and I've seen the the topics, and I think we're going to deliver again today. I can't believe this is week eight for this yes, show. Yes, yes, it flies by. We're going to open up the mailbag later in the show. We had some really good questions uh, come in on our uh, SEC Football Hour uh, mailbag on Twitter, and we'll do this uh, every couple of weeks to give you a chance to submit some questions. We'll do that later. Also, we'll take a look at the top five defensive line units. I'm interested to hear mm. – uh, what you think about that, Chris? I imagine we'll have some of the same teams on our list. We haven't seen each other's list, but I imagine there'll be some of the same teams. But I want to start with uh, breakout players. So I've picked four teams, and we'll do this for the next few weeks until we hit all 16, uh, and go through breakout players. One player that we expect to have a breakout year uh, for each of these four teams. So this week we'll look at Texas, Florida, Mississippi State, and Auburn. So, Chris, for Texas, who in your mind needs to to be a breakout player for the Longhorns in 24? All right, a breakout player for Texas. This was kind of tough. They've got some up-and-coming guys. Only every team every year, somebody's going to step into a bigger role. But I just liked Maury Nye Black when he was at Alabama. Mm. He caught 20 balls for 16.4 yards per catch, when you average 16 and a half yards per catch as a tight end, that means you've got some explosiveness. I don't know Steve's philosophy on tight loss. And somebody's going to fill the void in what high, highly, highly productive offense. And I think to me, he's a guy after having watched him play and seen his raw talent, that's a guy to me that's got a chance to step up and eclipse what he did. I thought he was a great addition when Texas picked him up uh, for sure. And so, yeah, I, I think that's a good pick. I went with uh, running back CJ Baxter. Uh, I think because I feel like when you have the offense that Texas does, like I think they're going to be great throwing the ball. I think they've got great receivers. They got Quinn Ewers. He's got a great arm, but, like they need to establish the run game very quick. Like that is just going to enhance their uh, offensive ability. And I know CJ Baxter is a great running back, but I think he needs to have a breakout year in in not letting just this offense be a an air game, but also get things done on the ground as well. So I, I'm looking for CJ Baxter to just break loose this year and have a a really good year. Yeah, and people might take issue with your definition of breakout because he had 659 yards rushing and 156 receiving last year. But he's getting some preseason All-SEC love. And I think the thing I look at, that yards per carry was a little bit under five yards a carry. I, I think, to yeah. me, he could meet your definition just by being more productive per touch. 
Right. Yeah. And that's 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 kind of where I was was going out with that. So that's Texas. All right, Florida. Who yeah. is uh, a player you would see need to have a breakout year for the Gators this year? All right, I'm I'm sticking in the tight end family. And when I watched this guy play last year, I saw him catch seven bowls for 99 yards against Vanderbilt. He had four touchdowns on 26 catches. He had 289, 289 yards as a true freshman. You don't see a lot of freshmen step in and you know catch four touchdowns their first year. But you, when, when you saw him play and get an expanded opportunity to do more things, which I would presume this guy would have that chance this year, uh, Arliss Boardingham is my pick here for the Gators. Okay. Tight end. Yeah, and I think that that needs to be a, a go-to position this year uh, for Florida. So I went to the defensive side for Florida because they were not very good defensively last year. They finished 11th in the SEC in total defense. And there was one guy who had a really good start to the year but was injured. Uh, that is Shamar James, linebacker for the Gators. He had 55 mm -hmm. tackles in eight games and then was injured. And he was a big part of the defense. when he When he went out, there was – really nobody there and so to me he needs to have a breakout year and he needs to be better than last year uh he needs to stay healthy I know he can't really help that but um he needs to be a big anchor of this Florida defense this year and to have him back I think is going to be huge for Florida but he needs to have a breakout year and, and those numbers need to go up and hopefully he will have a full healthy season we will see those numbers go up but the uh, they need some help tackling, and I think Shamar James can can definitely help the case there for Florida. Yeah, All he right. was fairly productive for them a, a year ago, but you know got a chance to to push it up. And the, the Gators certainly with that schedule need somebody to to step up. I I like that pick too. Yeah. All right, Mississippi State. Who would you say uh, breakout player for the uh, for the Dogs needs to be? Well, they added a lot of transfers on offense, but the guy that I kind of like was a guy that was with them last year. And, and running back in this system has been a, a weird thing, right? Un, under Mike Leach and then the, the switch last year to new coaching staff, that was a one-year thing. But I don't know how many people know Kayvon Lee, their running back, when he was at Penn State, he ran for 134 yards, 134 yards as a true freshman against Penn State. Um, that That's one that, if you do that as a true freshman and you're recruited to that kind of roster, that means you got some talent. That's what I'm watching. Looks to me like he's going to be the starter there by default. That that's a guy that I think could could really see a big jump in his numbers. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's, that's a really good one as well. I I stayed on the defensive side with Mississippi State because when you look at uh, and I know different uh, different sites, different magazines have different things, but really there's just one or two returners on defense, uh, returning starters for Mississippi State. And one of those guys is DeMonte Russell. And so I think he needs to have a breakout year. He's, he's, uh, his, his brother, the linebacker, um, Don Terry Russell, is back. He's got some experience. But DeMonte is that anchor on the defensive front. Uh, he, he's defensive end. And I think he needs to have a breakout year in the fact that he is kind of the anchor of the defense. He, he has the most experience. Uh, he's been a bulldog in the past, and so uh, I, I say he needs to have a breakout year as far as leading the defense and, and getting things done, but also on that front, uh, on that defensive front for Mississippi State. They're going to be offensive heavy. There's no doubt Jeff Levy uh, with an offensive background and has been a coordinator and a good offensive coordinator, so uh, they're going to have to focus some on the defense, and I think having the experience and the leadership of DeMonte Russell uh, could definitely help the Bulldogs. And by the way, point of clarification, Lee was playing at Penn State and, and had that game against Michigan. I can't remember if I said that backwards or not, but if, if I did, uh, clarification here. All right, yeah, good. Uh, the Auburn Tigers, breakout player, Chris, for uh, for the Tigers here in year two under Hugh Freeze. Cam Coleman, right? I mean, MVP of the spring game, maybe number one receiver in the country, getting Julio Jones comps, hey, you know, easy point to break out when you have no stats. So to, to me, that was maybe that was a cheat code there, but that was my pick. And I think that's a good one. Uh, I'm going very and I, and I try not to go quarterback, but I feel like for Auburn in the situation they're in, like Peyton hmm. Thorne has to have a breakout year. Like he's not going to be able to get it yeah. to Cam Coleman or any other receiver. They've, they've stacked this receiver room. It's good. 
but they need to have a quarterback to get it to them. And I think Peyton Thorne the, needs some consistency. That was an issue last year. Uh, of course, Robbie Ashford was there and coming in some last year. So he's never had this position really on his own. He needs to have a breakout year this year to help Auburn. I, I, and I hate to say everything revolves around the quarterback, but I feel like in Auburn's case, it does. I think the season goes how Peyton Thorne makes it go. And so I, I think he's the most important player on the field this year for Auburn. Chase, spoiler alert, that name is going to come up again out of my mouth later in the show. I won't tell you when or where, but I'll save my thoughts on that for now and hold it for later because I, I think we're we're thinking alike on some things today. Yeah, okay, that's noted. Uh, I'll remember that. So that is uh, some breakout players. We'll do this for all 16 teams. We started with four today. We'll do four uh, next week until we get uh, a breakout player for all 16 SEC teams. So we will move now to uh, to some rankings. We like to rank things uh, on this show. Last episode, we did top five offensive line units. Today, we're going to do our top five defensive line units in the SEC getting ready for 2024. And so uh, we'll run through those now. And uh, so, Chris, what is your number five? We'll, and we'll work down from five to one, one being the best. And so uh, who is your number five defensive line unit in the SEC? Well, full disclosure, I had had a little trouble separating my three to five. I, I, I kind of I, I shuffled them a couple times in my rankings, and, and I'm probably going to get a little heat for this because I've, I've got them listed a little bit lower than some places you see. But I've got Texas A&M at number five. Uh, okay. They get Purdue transfer Nick Skelton, who was a monster off the edge, going to be probably in contention. Uh, for the nation's lead in sacks. They got Shamar Turner, who moves inside. He had 10 and a half stops for loss. They've got some really good talent. Of course, they lost Walter Nolan. I, I feel like I've, I've got, I'm not saying they don't have good depth. I'm just saying when you compare them to some other teams in front of them, I've got a little bit more of a question there as compared to some some other teams. But I, I think a is very happy with its defensive line core, and, and I would be too if I were an Aggie. Yeah, for sure. And so... uh all right, there you go. Chris has A&M at his number five. I've got the Alabama Crimson Tide at number five. Hmm. Um, and I, you know, and and I, I struggled putting these together too, especially the the latter half. I feel like the uh, the top is is pretty good, but um, you know, it's 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 a new staff. They do get uh, LT Overton from A and M. You got uh, Latham. You got uh, Keon Keeley on the edge. I think uh, you know the the middle is good. Uh, Tim Keenan uh, is back, so I, I think they're pretty strong. Are they as strong as past defensive lines for Alabama? I'm not sure. You know, and and we'll see with the new scheming with with the new coaching staff. But I like these guys. Um, they're they're. Uh, they're really good offense in the SEC, though, and, and that, that they're going to see this year. So I, I think for them, I'm going to have to wait and see how they how they play together. But I like what I see on paper from this defensive yeah. line of Alabama. Yeah, they, they Alabama did not make my list. It was under consideration, and it's just not a, a star-studded name unit like it was in the past. But, hey, that may be my mistake because – Alabama has been known to recruit and develop defensive linemen before. So, like, if Alabama ends up there, um, especially with the Tims in the middle, uh, would it be a shock? Of course not. Yeah. All right. So, number four, who is your number four defensive line unit? My number four, and, and I'm almost a little tempted to put these guys higher, is Texas. You've got Ethan Burke, you've got Alfred Collins, they're returnees, they are all SEC candidates. And the thing that I've said in shows before, they got Trey Burke, who was a monster at UTSA. And I know it's a different level of competition, but he had 18 tackles for loss and eight sacks. They don't have a definite starting position for that kid. How yeah. many defensive line rooms would he walk into and be a starter day one? A lot. So to me, that tells me something a little bit about Texas, not just what they've got coming back. And they do have several bodies who played parts in their success a year ago. Um, they've got easily, what, um, a half dozen returnees with significant experience. I could even make the case that Texas could be higher here, Chase, and you might. 
I actually have them at four as well um, uh, on on my list. So and I and for a lot of the same reasons um, that that you just listed, I think it'll be interesting to see because they did lose some guys out of that the middle of the front from last year. Um, you know, did mm-hmm. they did they do enough to replace those guys? Uh, I think that'll be important to see. Um, Having uh, Baron Sorrell back at edge, I think, is is really important. Uh, you know, they got some transfers, but, you know, what what is the middle going to look like? I, I think we'll just have to wait and see. But, uh, yeah, I've got them at number four as well. And, again, for a lot of the same reasons that uh, you had them there at four. So, who is your number three, Chris? My number three is the Tennessee Volunteers. And I think if you've got – maybe the number one pick in the draft occupying one of your edge spots. You probably got to be in the top five. Of course, that's James Pierce. Uh, But they've also got Omari Thomas and Omar Norman Lott, of guys that have gotten some preseason All-SEC love that have been there a while and played some ball. That line is not just a one-trick pony. I I think the Vols, a deserving inclusion in the top five here. Yes, and and I agree with that. Um, I'll talk about Tennessee in a second. Uh, My number three, Ah. I've got – I've got the Ole Miss Rebels. Um, and, you know, Lane okay. Kiffin, I thought, did a, did a really good job of kind of enhancing the defense in the offseason. He made that a priority. We know he's going to have a good offensive team, but he did a great job, I feel like, of, of going to get guys uh, on defense. Um, and, I mean, you've got Walter Nolan, uh, Princely, you, I'll just say that. You know, he got out of the portal <laughs> uh, from from Florida. Um Cam Franklin uh, in the in the recruiting cycle, uh, JJ Pegues, um up there. I mean, I I think this is, and we've talked about Ole Miss. We've we've done a team preview on them. I really like what they did on the defensive side of the ball, and uh, I I really like what they've done yeah. to the defensive line. And I think this this will will be the best defense that Ole Miss has seen in a long time. And I think it starts up front. I really like what they've done and the players they've assembled there on the defensive line. Yeah, uh, spoiler alert, Ole Miss is my number two. And we do something I'll just call the ink test. You've seen, we we share our show prep. And uh, I do a thing where I go through and say, like, where's the guy getting All-American love? Where is he getting All-SEC love? And it may go four teams deep, but it tells me, hey, this guy's perceived to be in the the realm of an All-SEC and All-American guy if things go well. Nobody had more defensive linemen that passed the ink test than did Florida. Princely and Walter Nolan both getting some All-American love. J.J. Pegues and Jared Ivey, returnees who are getting some preseason All-SEC love. Uh, they've got a little bit of depth coming back, not not a lot. Actually, they're going to be leaning probably on Jeffrey Rush and Cam Franklin for depth, both uh, Franklin in particular, a top 100 recruit. But, if, like, man, if you got four guys that are getting some, some run for preseason All-SEC on the defensive line, that's probably a special unit. And that's why I went with Ole Miss at two. Yeah, and I think that's fair. I I went back and forth with with Ole Miss being three or two, but um, and it's it's really remarkable what uh, what what Lane Kiffin did out of the portal, especially on defense. Like he mm-hmm. has assembled a really strong uh, defense, and especially there up front. So uh, I've got Tennessee at number two. You had them at number three. I've got uh, the mm-hmm. balls at number two. And uh, I mean James Pierce Jr. I think, and you mentioned his name. That's that's kind of where you start to be on the defensive line. Um, Ten sacks, fourteen and a half tackles for loss. Uh, he's really good, and if he stays healthy, this defensive line is going to be great. He's he's the anchor. He's the the big man there. So um, just with him, I like Tennessee. But then the pieces around him are great as well. And so I think this is going to be an outstanding defensive line for Tennessee. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, to seeing them uh, as as we roll through the season. But yeah, they they should be very fun to uh, to watch. Number one, who is your uh, who is your number one? Chase, I think we're on the same page here, and let's let's just call this what it is. It, it's it's you are until you're not. Um, yeah. I I feel like you know some of the name you could you could argue that maybe Ole Miss is a little better or Tennessee, but I mean, come on. Georgia pumps out defensive linemen like nobody's business. You've yeah. got a couple of returning All-American candidates in Stackhouse and Williams. 
They've always got just five stars, four stars, just loaded on the depth chart. Guys that don't even play, <laughs> you know, we're ranked four and five stars sometimes. So yeah. to me, it's Georgia till it's not. I And I completely agree with that. I mean, it's, it's a complete reload, uh, even from the guys they've lost last year. Um, and, and they got multiple guys back, you know, uh, on the defensive line, Stackhouse, Brinson, uh, Dawkins, uh, who, who, you know, he battled an injury, but I think he'll be good for the season. Like, it's just, it's a factory there. And like you said, they will be until they're not. Like, uh, it, it, to take them out of the top of anything, I'll just have to, to you know, that's one of those things you, you have to see it to believe it. Like, they're, they're going to be at the top. Yeah really in every category until there's reason not to put them there and there. That's definitely not right now. Yeah. Yeah. There, so that there, is there's our, a reason Georgia's preseason number one, and that's part of it. Right. Yeah. And uh, what's interesting though, is in a lot of the rankings, as I was looking at some other magazine rankings and things like that, when it comes to defensive lines, just to see kind of where the sec stacks up. And I feel like in years past, mm -hmm. the sec would have been one of the top, you know, conferences for defensive line units, but um, it it doesn't appear that way this year. It looks like the Big Ten mm. is uh, is pretty strong as far as defensive lines go. That kind of surprised me. I thought the SEC would be at the top. Yeah, but guess what? The SEC snagged maybe the Big Ten's best lineman out of the portal, uh, what, what A&M did true. to Purdue there. So who knows, right? Yeah, yeah, that's very true. I, and I liked your pick having A&M in there. Uh, I, I thought about putting A&M yeah. uh, in the top five. Uh, they probably would have been six uh, on my list if we extended it. Yeah. I uh, had Alabama there at five, but I liked your pick there with uh, with A&M. So that's our top five defensive line units in the SEC. And we'll continue to do rankings as we, uh, we continue the show here, getting ready for the 2024 season. All right, let's dive into this uh, mailbag. It is the SEC Football Hour mailbag. We've got four really good questions that were submitted to us mm -hmm. uh, uh, via Twitter. And uh, and I, I love doing this, Chris, giving the uh, folks an opportunity to, uh, some, to ask some questions. But we have really, really good questions here. So here's our first question. It comes to us uh, from Hayden Ballard. He said, a team picked by you guys to finish number 10 through number 16 that has the best chance to finish in the top seven of the SEC. What would be your answer to that? Uh, what a, a team we picked to finish number 10 through number 16 that has the best chance to finish in the top seven of the SEC. Chase, my answer is that I don't have a real answer. Um, but because, and look, there's, there's two different types of rankings. One's a power ranking and one is a, where do you pick them, which is based on the schedule. And we have talked a lot about how the schedules are uneven. But I'll give you a team that I think is maybe being a little bit underrated by the computer models. I th think their, their talent might be a little better than it's been given credit for being. And, and if it does, then those computer models jump a little bit and the spreads uh, would start to narrow. And, that, and that's Kentucky. Now, I, I think this is – a less than 50% chance that it happens. Um, yeah. And off the top, okay, they're, they're probably going to get throttled at Georgia, and probably that game at Ole Miss is not very favorable in terms of, of their chances of winning. But that they go to Florida, that, that's probably going to be a field goal game. Um, they go to Tennessee, that's not easy either. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of – I'm sort of destructing my argument here as I construct it uh, because I think they're going to be decided underdogs at Georgia, at Ole Miss, um, at, at Tennessee, and at Texas. But, hey, four and four um, could get you in the top seven and then pull an upset somewhere. I, I, I don't feel real strong about that pick, but I had a really hard time answering that question, and that's the place that I – I arrived at uh, by by trying to answer it. I, I I think I bet I know who your answer is. I'm going to see, and you, you might be. I think I'm going to like your answer better than mine. Well, I had a hard time with this one as well because I'm looking at here's I, I'm yeah. looking at. I took my predicted order of finish. I did a video on that a couple of weeks ago, uh, how I voted in the SEC media poll, and so I, I kind of took that. 
and to, to answer this question. And, and I mentioned this team earlier, and that's the Auburn Tigers. I've got them at number 10. Yep. And my thought process behind why they could be a top seven team, that, that's the one I'm going with, is I look at their schedule. And, yes, they have um, their SEC games or Arkansas, Oklahoma, at Georgia, at Missouri, at Kentucky, Vandy, A&M, and Alabama. Um, the at Georgia, at Missouri, and Alabama are going to be very tough games. Not to say the other ones aren't going to be. They are. Uh, they're going to be very tough games for Auburn. But I feel like the positioning of the schedule, how things fall, I think kind of plays in the favor of Auburn. They have um, – Oklahoma at home, AM at home, Arkansas at home. Um, so I, I think those are because they're in Auburn, those could be winnable games for the Tigers. So I, I think, and going back to Peyton Thorne, if he's consistent, yeah. I think this team could be pretty good. And so I, I'm going to go with the Auburn Tigers. I picked them 10. I think they could be a top seven team. Um, but I looked at the rest of my, and I, I, I agree what you said with Kentucky. I just, I feel like this is a year though in the SEC and most people voted this way in the predicted order finish at SEC media days. I feel like it's kind of a clear cut year. These are our top teams. These are our bottom teams. Like I, I don't see one of these bottom teams coming up and being top six in the SEC. That could happen. Um, but uh, I feel like maybe the maybe one of these borderline teams like Auburn. I, I feel like they could could be a top seven team. So that that's who I, I roll knew with. you're going to pick Auburn. I just I, th- I think we've done enough of these that I know how your mind works, and that's why I said before I like I think I'm going to like your pick better than mine. Yeah, I started thinking that that schedule is a lot more favorable than Kentucky's is too. Although by the way, the teams do play, and that's that's in Lexington, so that that could maybe have a little say in if it does turn into a battle, one of these two, who who gets that one? Yeah. Yeah. So that was a good question. Hayden Ballard, appreciate your question, submitting that uh, to us on Twitter. All right. Here's another question. I thought this was a really good question too. And he gives us a little, this is from Ed Holinsky on Twitter. Uh, in your estimation, which school is going to be the surprise of the SEC season? But he gives us a little um, caveat here. Surprise can be good or awful. So we can can take that into mm-hmm. consideration. So uh, in your estimation, Chris, which school is going to be the surprise? And that surprise can be good or bad. I'm I'm sort of circling on, on two teams. W- one of them is Alabama. To be honest, I have not made up my mind on Alabama yet. I've got a little more thinking to do on that one. But the one, you, you know me, I've been high on this team ever since we did their preview. I think the roster is better than people think. Now, the schedule is brutal, and that may be prohibitive, but I, I think Oklahoma could be the team that we look up and say, hey, they pulled a couple of upsets, and they are firmly in the playoff when it is announced just because of that body of work. I love that roster. I, I love what Brent Venables is doing there. That is my team that I think if somebody jumps up, because you've seen Oklahoma, what, six, seven, eight by a lot of people? Yeah. Um, I think you could argue Oklahoma's got a – a top three, four roster in this league, potentially. Yeah, I I, I agree with you. I, I think they're one of those teams. They're one that I thought about, again, and and we've done quite a few videos on them. I, I like Oklahoma. I like where they are heading into the season. Um, I'm interested to see how it how it how how they play in first year of the SEC. I think they fit in nicely. Yeah, I think they definitely could be a surprise. I'm, I'm going with... Um, a good surprise as well. And I've got Texas A&M in my predicted order of finish at nine. Mm. But I think A&M, I, they're lining up to it. And again, there's a lot of questions. New head coach, new staff, you know. I like Connor Wegman, though, at quarterback. Barring he stays healthy, I think he's going to have a great year. I think A&M could be a team that that can can shock some folks, can turn some heads. I look at their schedule. Um, their SEC games are Florida, Arkansas, Missouri, Mississippi State, LSU, South Carolina, Auburn, and Texas. So they've got some tough games. Uh, But I think they're in a position where we know they're going to have a good defense because Mike Elko is a great defensive coach. I think he's a great head coach. They're going to have a good offense as well, especially with Connor Wegman. Um, 
I I just I really like they just I have a feeling that A and M is going to win some games that that they shouldn't, and I think that Texas Texas A and M rivalry game that uh, will be renewed this year is going to be a fantastic game. I'm not picking A and M on an upset at this point right now, but I think A and M is going to be a lot better than than people think. And and even when I made my predicted order finish, the more I look at A and M, like I feel like they could be better than than where I have them at number nine. So I think uh, A&M could be a surprise this season. Chase, I'm going to give some support to the argument you just made. You know that little model I build based on what what I think the lines could end up being based on what some computers are saying. How many times do you think A&M is an underdog this year? Uh, I'm going to say three. Three. And, And guess what? Uh, last I looked, the uh, Vegas took issue with one of those because the computers have got Notre Dame even being on the road about a two-point favorite over the Aggies. Guess what? I think the odds makers have flipped that to about a point and a half. So if you take that answer above what the computers have, now you're down to two games in which AM is an underdog. One of those games is LSU. Uh, that is in College Station, and LSU is a point two point favorite. Now, I'm guessing that that one's going to flip based on home field advantage if A&M is what we're looking at. Well, guess what? Just for argument's sake, and, and I'm glossing over the fact that uh, the Missouri game, A&M would be less than a one-point favorite, but just play along. If A&M wins all the games that they're favored and, and Vegas takes them as a favorite in LSU, guess what? They're going into that game with Texas undefeated and about a seven-point underdog to end the season. Wouldn't that be something? That would be something. That sure would. Um, Yeah, so I I mean, I I really do think Mike Elko was a great hire for A&M. I think probably one of the best hires they could have made. And so, yeah, it would surprise me none – if uh if a and m was was in the talk as as one of the top you know five or six SEC teams when it's all said and done. So that was a really good question. Ed Helensky submitting that to us uh there on Twitter. All right, moving to question number three. I thought this was a really good one. It comes from Brent uh here in our mailbag. Should the SEC start week one within conference games? I thought that's an interesting question. I want to hear your thoughts, Chris. I loved all our questions. Um, there's two ways I can answer this one. Would I love to see it? Absolutely. Given what is its take? Absolutely not. Um, you got teams competing for playoffs. You, you need some break-in games. Some teams this year got them. Uh, some teams, I'm, I'm looking at, at UAM. I'm looking at ULSU. I'm looking at um, U Vanderbilt, although they're in a different category. Um, I'm looking at U Georgia. Did, did not get your your Hey, let, let's get an easy win here to start the season kind of game. But it, does it make for better viewing? It absolutely does. And I'm I'm always on the side of better viewing. Does it make sense for the league with what's at stake? No, it does not. Yeah, and this has happened before. So I want to go back to uh, last year. I, as, as in conjunction with covering SEC football, as I do here every day, I cover some Jacksonville State football. And, and uh, last year, Jacksonville State opened their season with a Conference USA game against UTEP and the atmosphere for this game was unlike any I'd been to at Jack State um there was so much on that it was just really fun season opener because it was a conference game like uh and that was the first time that it happened to Jacksonville State that it worked out that way it was their first FBS game their first conference USA game all in one and so it was electric there was a lot on the line it was the most exciting season opener I'd ever been to and I feel like that would be the case coaches would hate this uh but from from a fan like myself I think it'd be pretty cool because it would add something to these opening games you you think about week one of the college football season and there's not a I mean there's a handful of of good games but what do they actually mean you know like and and they could mean stuff for for postseason for the playoffs especially now but uh and I'm not saying I would be in fan of every team having a conference game you know first game but it does add some flavor you know it 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 uh, it it means a little more you know when when you play a conference game and I think it makes for really fun openers so you know I I don't think 
every team should start with one, but it does. I think it would make for some fun. Chase, I'm just going to pick a, a team at random. Um, Ole Miss. What do you think is going to get better TV ratings slash attendance slash just general excitement? Ole Miss's first two home games against Furman and not not picking on you, Middle Tennessee State. Uh, you're my you're my backyard. Actually, did some schooling there, but um, that or let, let's go down the schedule a little bit more. Uh, home games with Georgia and Oklahoma. I'm just going to ask you, but make a wild guess. What's going to generate a little bit more excitement? I would say Ole Miss, Oklahoma, week one. What, what else generates? What else does that excite? It generates money, right? Yes. And, and money is what drives all this stuff. It's TV revenues. I mean, I, I've told you guys, I've said this many times. I'm amazed now in hindsight, how much money did the SEC, how many millions of dollars did the SEC leave on the table by not starting the SEC network earlier? Yeah. Um, and, and like now look at what's happening in baseball, what's happening in basketball, all that exposure and what it's done for the league and what it's done for revenues. You see it in facilities. Here's what I'm getting at. I, I think, Chase, one day, if you and I are doing the show from a nursing home, and w- boy, wouldn't that be fun. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're old. We've seen a lot. I, I, I don't know. I just wonder if there's going to be a day in time where this is more like the NFL and you're seeing, I don't know, 10, 12 SEC games. You're seeing games against the Big Ten and Maybe you get one mulligan, you know, you get warm warm up against uh, an MTSU or a Furman or somebody. But I think eventually the way the money is going, there's so much to be made. I mean, the playoff, another thing. It just amazes me that it took us this long. Because look at the parity, look at the money that's going to be coming, look at the excitement. College football is a more interesting game than it's ever been. And I'm I'm thinking working backwards from the way the world works. I wonder if there's going to be a day in time where we're not having this discussion anymore because the money will have dictated all of it. Yeah, and I think back to the COVID year, you know, when it was just all yeah. SEC games. Like, what a fun year, you know? Like, yeah, you have a conference game every week, you know? And that I, th- I feel like that made for more excitement, you know? Does everybody get up for, again, Ole Miss and Furman and whoever you mentioned a minute ago, their opener? Like, not as many people get up for those games. Like, yeah, you you need those. You, you want some tune-ups, but, like, you, you don't get up for those games. If it was an SEC yeah. game to start the season, everyone would be up for that game. So yeah. from a fan's perspective, I think that'd be awesome. Uh, so yeah. that's a great question. Was, yeah, maybe, maybe one day we'll go like the NFL where you see, you know, one team invites another team to its camp for three days for practice. Maybe we'll see Georgia yeah. and Alabama practicing, Yeah, um, you know, against each other. I, I just think that the, the day is coming where this is going to be more like the NFL. And I just think that's one thing that, Right now, I get it, but I, it just makes too much sense for the system to, to stay the way it is. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, great question, Brent. Appreciate that. And our fourth and final question comes to us from Eli. He says, how hot is Billy Napier's seat? What would you answer that, Chris? Listen, to some people, sounds not like it's not very hot at all. I, I don't know. Um, I mean, it, it felt like he had the hottest seat of anybody, but now I'm I'm starting to wonder, and in, in the schedule I've said before, um, you know, he goes six and six in that schedule. I'm sorry, it's it may not be a good year for Florida fans, but that's a good year. Um, you know, the, Florida could nine and three it with somebody else's schedule potentially. So I, I don't know. I've I've changed my tune on that one a little bit. Yeah, you know, that's uh, interesting. You say that. Um, I kind of have to. I, I I feel like this is he has got a lot of must win games. And I think some people at Florida are very against him or ready to see him go. And I, I think you there are some Florida fans that 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 see hope in in this season. And so the schedule is just so hard, though. Um, and I would say things aren't going the way that Florida would want them to go. And so that automatically kind of points to a coaching change. I just I don't know how I don't know how quick they'll do it. I don't know how patient they want to be. Um, I feel like I just don't I don't understand the Florida program right now, and I haven't for yeah. some time. Um, you know, Dan Mullen had some good years. He didn't, and he was gone. And so I I, I just I can't figure out really. I can't put my finger on kind of where the Florida program is, what their kind of vibe is around Billy Napier. Uh, and I haven't been able to figure that out really since, you know, the last five or six years, I feel like. 
Well, I'm glad you're as confused as I am. There's <laughs> there's a little little company in confusion here. Yes, but I feel like he definitely needs to win a lot of football games this year. And if he doesn't, then this conversation will not be good. You know, towards the end of the year, I think we're yeah. definitely in that scope. Hey, look, he, he goes three and nine. None of this is going to matter. Nobody's going to care how hard the schedule was or whatever. And and look, that is a yeah. that is a possibility with that schedule. But yeah, I, I think that's a that's one of the easily one of the five most interesting questions I think heading into this season. Yeah, I I would certainly agree with that. So appreciate the question, Eli. That is our mailbag for this week, and we'll continue to do this. Love getting your questions in. And uh, you can uh, drop us a question in the comments or, or tweet us as well, and we'll add that uh, to the next time we have a mailbag here on the SEC Football Hour. All right, let's move into some Who Said This, where we will share a quote from a current or retired SEC head coach, and the other will guess it. Uh, I'll go first, and the more I read my quote, I'm, I hope you haven't done this one. I don't know, it sounds familiar to me now that I – read it over and over again but i'll go first hopefully you don't know this um so here we go who said this you can learn more character on the two yard line than anywhere else in life <laughs> your concern was very well founded i you have, have used that. that one on you before okay <laughs> now here's where it gets interesting <laughs> god god knows if i can remember who said it um I want to say, no, I think you, I think when I asked you this, you guessed Bear Bryant. I think that's what's in my head. I think that was, I want to say it was a Paul Dietzel LSU quote. Am I right? You are correct. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, don't man, tell my wife because she accuses me of not being able to remember anything. <laughs> and if I remember the football <laughs> thing like that, then I'll be in trouble. Yeah, you know, and and when I first saw this, when I was looking looking quotes up, I thought, oh, this is really good. But it just hit me as I was I have my notes on half the screen, and I was looking over there, getting ready to to move to this, and I thought he may have said this before. So eh, good memory there. Uh, so yeah, I will I will do better next time of remembering what cro- quotes that we have used. Um, but I thought that was a really good one from Paul Dietzel here from LSU. So what's your quote, Chris? Well, I had the same concern. I feel like this one might have been used on the show before, but I don't think it has been. Uh, but we'll try it out. Um, this one is, is a short one. Motivation is simple. You eliminate those who aren't motivated. Mm. I feel like that's an older coach. Um. Hmm. Motivation. It kind of sounds like a Bear Bryant quote. You've hit me with a lot of Bear Bryant Bryant quotes, though, so I'm not going to go with that one. Hmm. Is that Lou Holtz? You nailed it, sir. Very good. I was going to give you a hint if you need. It was one of the more quotable coaches in the league, and that was indeed a Lou Holtz quote. Okay. I I think this is the first time we both. I think so too. Nailed the quotes. Yes. Partly because I used one before, and and I right. feel like I I look at a lot of these quotes. Uh, I don't think I've seen that motivation one, but I feel like that's in the Lou Holtz. Yeah. Like he says yeah. things like that, and so yeah. My, well, my first thing is like who who could I see saying this? Like who does yeah. that sound like? And it's usually wrong, but in this case, we we got it. So yeah, all right, good for us. It's taken long enough for us both to get it, so I'm glad <laughs> we did. All right, so that was who said this. Let's move into our final segment here. Likely or unlikely, we'll both give a couple of scenarios and see if the other one thinks they're likely or unlikely. I'll go first. Here's my first scenario. Is this likely or unlikely, Chris? Texas A&M wins nine games. Hmm. Let me look at this. Yeah, I, I think I I like their chances, um, it's, especially if they get Notre Dame. And that's going to be an open or it's going to be – I'm sure it's going to be hot. People are going to be excited. That that atmosphere is going to be frenzied. I feel like they'll get one, and I feel like if they get Notre Dame, they can get nine. Yeah. 
I think that's definitely where it all starts. Like you, you want to win that uh, that opener against Notre Dame because I feel like you look at the rest of the schedule. I think it's very winnable. And I talked about them earlier. Like I think they could be much better than when than what other people think. So I think they um, they could hit that uh, that nine that nine win season. I think and that I think that'd be spectacular in Mike Elko's first year at A and M. Yeah, I do too. All right. I'll get one for you, and, and this okay. is one that I, I love the question, and, and I want to see how you answer it. All right. Oklahoma's Jackson Arnold winds up with more yards of total offense than Nico. Tennessee's Nico, whose uh, last name I will not attempt to pronounce right now. I'm going to go likely. I'm going to go okay. likely. Uh, I'm – I love the receivers at Oklahoma, and I, I think Jackson Arnold, while he does lack experience, I think he's going to step in and and uh, and have a great year. And I think um, I think he's got so many good targets. I think Nico does too. Um, but you know what? I'm I'm gonna ride with Oklahoma. I think that, again. I think the Oklahoma. We've talked about them. I think they're going to be better than what people think they are. Like, um, yeah, I, I'm going to say likely. I like it. I think Jackson Arnold will. I'll tell you why I would hesitate on that one. And then there's two reasons, okay? Now, Jackson Arnold was further along as a quarterback. Like, Nico was a high school volleyball player who was a little later to football and and is making it work, clearly, it seems at this point. But schedule is a big thing. And A&M's schedule, um, excuse me, Oklahoma's schedule is, I think, significantly harder than Tennessee's. Now, that that also leaves you an out somewhere to where if – their Tennessee's beating somebody 40 to nothing in the second quarter. Then if you're smart, you sit Nico on the bench and that, that rules out the compiling stats phase of the game for him. But I, th- I think it's right. interesting because I think the schedule might have something to say uh, about that too. Yeah. And, and that's a good point. Uh, I was just kind of going by my thoughts on each quarterback, not considering the schedule, but now that you think about it, yeah, yeah I think that's a big factor. Um, I'll, I'll be interested to see what if we if come back to this question at the end of the year. But that was really good. That was a really good scenario, Chris, uh, with two kind of inexperienced quarterbacks. That was good. Yep. So and, here and one more thing. Though, I said total yeah. offense, which includes rushing yards. Remember, both these guys are pretty mobile. Yeah, that's that's a good point as well. I like that. So I've got another. Uh, my scenario involves a quarterback as well. So likely or unlikely, Chris Taylor Green, Arkansas's quarterback, throws for. 2,200 plus yards Mm. this season. I I say 2,200 plus because last year, KJ Jefferson threw for 2,100 yards. So I'm I'm putting a little more on Taylor Green. Can he throw for 2,200 plus yards? Well, let's see. He threw for 1,752 last year. Also ran for some. So the, the running could eat into the passing a little bit, right? Yeah. Their receiving room... Uh, they got a lot of guys back outside of Andrew Armstrong. How good are those guys? Not entirely sure. But here's the other part. You look at their backups. They've got Malachi Singleton, who didn't play last year. They got K.J. Jackson, who's a true freshman. I think those are the two guys behind him. Part of the answer would be, okay, did, did somebody take the job? I don't see somebody taking the job. I mean, let's face it, that's that's under 200 yards a game. To get to that mark, sure, why not? Okay, I think he does it. I, yeah, I think it's definitely possible. Um, I mean, they have a tough schedule as well, but I think he's a good quarterback. And and Bobby Petrino is going to play to his strengths uh, when when Colin plays there for Arkansas. So yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely a possibility as well. All right, mine for you, and I, and I told you I would return to the topic of Peyton Thorn at some point. Um, and so here we go. And and again, I think mobility plays into this too, but Auburn's Peyton Thorne, does he finish with over or under 3,000 yards of offense? Or maybe maybe to rephrase it, is it likely that he finishes over 3,000 yards of total offense? And by the way, I'll give you a bowl game for that too. Do you have what he had last year? I will pull that up if you'll give me just a moment. Um, I feel like he's stagnated for two years. Yeah. I'm trying to kind of ball because he had some great runs last year, uh, just out of nowhere. Um, 
Okay, he this threw for 1,755 yards last year, and he ran for, uh, what, 515? So that's 2,200 right there. He was splitting some time with Robbie Ashford. They've got a better receiving room. Now, look, he did, back in 2021 at Michigan State, get that with passing alone, 3,240 yards. And in 22, he threw for 2,679, and he rushed for um, just 47 yards. His, his rushing production has been really weird. So it feels like he runs more at Auburn, but his passing numbers have suffered. You know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to go likely. I think he can, especially with this okay. receiving room. Uh, I think it'll be close. I don't think he's going to blow that out or anything. But yeah, I, I think I, I'm going to go likely. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to be optimistic here and go likely. Okay, and part of that would be: does, does he lose the job to anybody? And I don't know that they've really got a yeah. next guy up, do they? I I don't think so. Um, and I think yeah. that could be a that could be an issue for Auburn this year. Uh, for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I, he needs to be more consistent, but I, th- I think he can be, I think this could be a good year for him. Uh, he's had some time to get familiar with Hugh Freeze and his offense. And so, uh, this is an interesting year for Auburn. I really do. There, there's a lot of questions going into it, but, uh, yeah, that, that'll be, that'll be interesting. So that's some likely or unlikely, uh, here on today's episode. And that'll put a wrap on episode eight of the SEC football hour. Always enjoy talking some SEC football as we're just really a month away from getting the season kicked off for 2024. We will have game predictions coming your way soon for some week one games here on the Southeastern 16 channel. We've got team previews uh, out. We've got schedule previews out. We got some other videos uh, coming in as we'll break down schedules and, and everything. And so Uh, Keep it locked in right here on Southeastern 16. Subscribe to our channel if you have not already. Like this video. Share it with your friends. Spread the word about Southeastern 16. Also, if you're interested in sponsoring our content, if you have a business or or want to sponsor our content, you can shoot me an email, chase at southeastern14.com, or email uh, Caroline Smith, caroline.smith at southeastern14.com, and uh, that will get to us, and uh, we can start the conversation of sponsoring our content, but would love for you uh, to do that. Spread the word about Southeastern 16. We do this every week in conjunction with all the great videos we put out daily for SEC football, basketball, and baseball. So that'll do it for Episode 8. For Chris Lee, I'm Chase Robinson. We will talk to you next week with more of the SEC Football Hour here on Southeastern 16.